Thank you very Feel much. Feel free. Thank you. Yeah. So I'm going to tell you about out of time ordered correlation functions in open systems. And uh, firstly, I will, I will introduce this concept of out of time ordered correlation function. And I will tell you how, how, why and how I'm going to study it in, in open systems. Uh, so, so this talk is about quantum many body systems. So let me imagine a toy model of such a system, say a chain of qubits. So each ball here represents a qubit and say that one of these qubits, for example, that one is initialized in some local state uh, psi. So this psi is just state of that qubit. The rest, like the, the other qubits are initialized in some other states and, and let me evolve the system according to a unitary that is generated by the Hamiltonian of this quantum many body system. And then after some time, uh, uh, if you try to, to recover the state of that qubit with the help of local measurements, typically you would not be able to do so. Uh, because uh, due to that evolution, quantum information uh, spreads over degrees of freedom of that quantum many body system. So, so there are cor correlations are established between different qubits. And, and like the, the local information, information about that qubit is locally lost, so to say. And uh, this phenomenon in context of quantum body systems is known as quantum information scrambling. So, so basically it says that, as I uh, uh, said, that, that quantum information becomes inaccessible with, with the help of local measurements. And quantum information scrambling has been discussed in the context, for example, of quantum thermalization. So it was used to explain how it is possible that like evolution of a closed system leads to thermalization. And also in the context of quantum many body chaos, recently this becomes a vivid area of, of research. So uh, yeah, so we have this phenomenon of scrambling, but is there a way to quantify it? So, so to say how fast it happens or maybe to compare to different systems to say which one scrambles, uh, scrambles quantum information uh, more or less. So one of the tools that is used to, uh, to quantify scrambling is, are the so-called out of time ordered correlation functions. And I will refer, refer to them as to OTOCs. Uh, this is much shorter and more convenient. So, so what is such a correlation function? Uh, so, so you need two operators, W and V. Uh, in the context of this talk, I'm going to use just poly, uh, sorry, just poly uh, operators. So they are both Hermitian and unitary. But usually in, the pa in papers discussing scrambling, uh, people say that they need to be unitary. But in my case, they are going to be both unitary and Hermitian. So you have this W and V, and what you need to do is you need to compute the following trace in which uh, uh, enters uh, V and WT. And this WT is kind of Heisenberg evolved version of W. So you need to take the Hamiltonian that generates evolution of your system. You need to kind of evolve W and, and then this enters into the definition of, of, uh, of a, a OTOC. Uh, okay, so, so, so this is the expression for, for uh, those uh, correlation functions. And now let me kind of provide you with some intuition. What does this quantity tell you? So again, uh, let me uh, consider a chain of qubits and now say this psi is now state of all the qubits. And say that I will apply an operator V to the first qubit of the chain. This means that V acts non trivially only on the first qubit and it does not kind of affect the other qubits in that chain. Okay, so now I'm going to, to evolve this state according to the unitary evolution. And I'm going to apply W to the last qubit of the chain. And in that way, I prepared the following state. So now comes the last step of, of this simple protocol. So I'm going to apply U, but with dagger. So this means I'm going to kind of 
uh, reverse the time evolution or apply backward time evolution, because this is like the, the agent of, of that unitary here. Uh, this may be in principle hard, it, it is hard to do, but I mean, it is not forbidden. And in that way, you prepare the following state. So this is WT V acting on Psi. So now let me slightly change uh, the order of steps in that protocol. So, so firstly, I just prepare uh, the, my qubits in the same state as previously, so the same Psi. Uh, now I'm doing this evolution, this kind of forward time evolution, and I am applying W to the last qubit of the chain. And I'm going to do this backward time evolution as a third step, and then I'm going to apply V to the first qubit. So in this way, I prepared a different state, uh, this time V W T acting on Psi. So you can see that th those two states, they differ just uh, because the order of the operators that are applied to, to, to this state is different. So I can ask now, okay, how different are those two states? Uh, for example, by uh, computing the scalar product of those two states, and, and this is the expression for the scalar product, or if I write it with, with the help of trace, you basically recover the expression for, for uh, OTOCs. So you can think of OTOCs as, a, uh, as of functions that provide you information about uh, the influence of rever changing the order of application of, of, of these two operators. But also this is not just like changing of, of order, but also like in between there's this forward and backward time evolution of a quantum of a quantum many body system involved. So that there are kind of two factors uh, that play a role here. Okay. And uh, this was just like a, a very simple schematic scheme, but people are really interested in measuring these OTOCs in, in different systems. So they came up with a number of uh, kind of schemes aiming at measuring those uh, out of time order correlation functions. And also the, the, the first experimental results uh, have been reported. And all kind of all those protocols typically use this backward time evolution that I showed you. So this is not, this is not an artifact, but this is really the case. Uh, when you try to measure OTOCs, you somehow need to reverse the evolution of your system. And the question that I'm going to ask you is how uh, such, uh, how those quantities, so how those OTOCs are affected uh, when you, uh, uh, let your system of interest interact with some environment because this is what typically happens in experiment. And there ha have also been studies of, of, of this uh, in a number of papers, but my approach here is, is a different one because I'm going to use uh, uh, the so-called Feynman-Vernon influence functional approach. And this is basically uh, a path integral treatment of composite systems. So you take this uh, Feynman approach to quantum mechanics that is based on path integrals, but now you use it to investigate uh, composite systems in which you are uh, kind of able to uh, divide uh, degrees of freedom into the ones that you are interested in and the, the others that are not so interesting for you, or maybe you are not able to uh, to um, kind of monitor them. So you want to get rid of them uh, from your description. So basically you trace all those uh, other degrees of freedom. Usually you call them as, as an environment. So you trace out the environment from the description of your problem and you are left with the description of the dynamics of your system. And in terms of this Feynman-Vernon uh, approach, uh, you express your propagator in terms of the paths that concern only the system degrees of freedom. But there is one additional piece here, the so-called influence functional that basically captures the influence of the environment on, on, on your system. So everything that environment does to your system is, is captured here in this uh, influence functional. 
Uh, and I'm going to, to use this uh, uh, Feynman Venom influence functional to, to study OTOCs in, uh, in open systems. And basically, I'm going to study a qubit chain that is coupled to the environment. So, so this is the structure of the Hamiltonian of the problem. So, so the Hamiltonian of the system is some qubit uh, chain uh, Hamiltonian. Then there is environment and the interaction between the system and the environment. Uh, so as I said, um, the, the, this, like this, this technique allows you to treat uh, different uh, um, uh, different uh, systems. So, so the the precise form of the system Hamiltonian is not important. I, I wrote here one just to give you an impression how those Hamiltonians look like. So, so this is a Hamiltonian that you typically can find in uh, papers that study OTOCs. Now, uh, the, the, the environment is going to be described as a set of harmonic oscillators. And there is a, like a spectral density that captures all the important information about the coupling strength between those oscillators and the qubits. And when it comes to the coupling between the system and the environment, uh, an important thing is that each qubit of that chain is going to be coupled to, uh, to its own environment. So like those environments are independent and they do not mediate anything between different qubits of the chain. But you can relax the approach and also study other cases. Uh, but I'm not going to discuss it here. Okay, so uh, I told you what I'm going to study and how I'm going to study it. But like the most important question now is to, to kind of understand how the coherence enters expressions for those out of time order correlation functions. And there are two uh, kind of factors that you need to take into account. So, so usually you attribute the coherence to the fact that you are not able to monitor those uh, environmental degrees of freedom. So, so you are able to manipulate only system degrees of freedom. Uh, and this is usually the case. But here there is this, um, kind of uh, like, like those protocols that aim to measure OTOCs, they involve this backward time evolution. So you have one um, additional kind of possibility to study. So you can say that maybe I'm able to reverse the full evolution of the system and the environment because this is just like some magnetic field that I can flip uh, direction of that magnetic field and everything will start evolving backwards in time. But maybe this is not the case. Maybe I'm not able to reverse the evolution of, of the environment. And I'm going to discuss those two cases separately. So the first case here, I'm kind of assuming that I'm able to do this full backward time evolution. And also that I'm only able to control the system degrees. So I'm only kind of able to, to measure the system degrees of freedom. So then expression for your uh, OTOC is very similar to the one that I showed you previously. So the, the one that concerns closed systems. The only difference now is that you need to enter the density matrix of the system and the environment, the, the initial state of the system and the environment. And also that this evolution here, this is a joint evolution of your system and the environment. But there's the second case in which you are not able to do the backward time evolution of the environment. And then this expression becomes more ugly because like uh, there is like a unitary operator here, this S with uh, dagger means that I'm only doing the reverse uh, evolution on the system, not on the environment. And that's the reason why, why this is more uh, complicated. Okay, so, so I have all uh, the necessary ingredients. Uh, so now I can compute this Feynman Vernon influence functional. I'm using the uh, spin coherent representation for the uh, chain and also coherent states for the environment. And, and assuming that this environment is initially in a thermal state, you can compute this uh, influence functional. I'm not going to show you the, the result because it's quite complicated. It, it will not tell you much, but just let me remind you the structure. 
So we are going to, exp so I'm going to, so, so you have this expression for this open system, OTOC in terms of the path, rep path integral representation of the closed system OTOC times some modifying factor, this Feynman Vernon influence functional. So, so now uh, let me kind of try to convince you that this is useful, that this is not, not just some computation that you can do, but you can really extract some, uh, um, let's say uh, useful information about uh, OTOCs in open uh, systems. And in order to do so, let me just discuss briefly uh, some more properties of this uh, properties of this Feynman Vernon influence functional. So, so real part of the uh, of this functional uh, here is, is is greater than zero. And usually the studies of decoherence, this means that your system is going to deface. So it, some of diagonal elements are going to, uh, uh, to kind of decrease in time. But for OTOCs, you can easily show that uh, like the modulus of your uh, closed system OTOC is going to be greater or equal to the modulus of the uh, open system OTOC. And now uh, this in turn means that if you look at this quantity, like the smaller uh, an OTOC is, the modulus of OTOC is, it means that this scrambling uh, is more profound in the system. So, so this simple consequence is, you can understand it in a like relatively uh, easy way because if you couple your system, if scrambling is about spread of quantum information over different degrees of freedom of your system, if you couple it to some external environment, it kind of seems that quantum information has more op opportunities to spread because simply there are more degrees of freedom. And, and this, this, this inequality here kind of uh, reflects that fact. But you can do more than this you can also ask, for example, what is the most destructive way in which decoherence can affect uh, a measurement of your OTOC? And in order to do so, let me just assume that like decoherence dominates over dissipation. Like this functional here, apart from real part, has also imaginary part, like imaginary part describes dissipation, but I'm going to neglect this imaginary part for a moment. Usually you can say that this is like a, a valid assumption until uh, some, some time scale. But I'm going to assume this, this here too. So I'm just going to focus on this real part of the functional. And then you can bound your open systems uh, OTOCs from below. And this bound involves the, the value of the closed system OTOC and also some kind of exponential factor that affects uh, this, this uh, open system value. Uh, sorry, uh, just this exponential factor that uh, modifies the, the, the value of this closed system OTOC. And then uh, you can choose some spectral density uh, to, some, to see how those bounds behave. And, and just a, a quick, uh, uh, presentation here. So in this plot, you can see the bounds for, for open system OTOCs for different values of parameter S entering the spectral density and also different temperatures. And the solid line is for the case in which we reverse the evolution of the system and the environment. And this like uh, dashed line is in the case when you just reverse the evolution of the system only. And these are bounds. So, uh, but but an interesting thing here is that it seems that you get a stricter bound when you just reverse the evolution of the system alone. And it would be interesting to see if this is the really the case. So maybe in the experiments, uh, it would be more beneficial to kind of leave environment environment untouched. But as I said, this concerns only. Uh, the bounds. Uh, okay, so so this is my really my last slide. So so to conclude, 
this fame and Vernon influence functional provides new information about open systems OTOCs, because, for example, it allows you to study the how the coherence affects those quantities. Uh, but also, if you would do some numerical studies, it's more uh, kind of, it is more general approach than those based, for example, on, on living blood equations, because you can treat string, strong coupling between your system and, and the environment in that framework. And with, with this, uh, thank you very much for, for your attention. Thank you, Jan. Thank you so much, especially for being uh, nearly perfectly on time. Thank you very much. Uh, very interesting, very interesting presentation. Uh, I have myself a couple of questions. Jarek beats me on that, so I okay. think I should give him the uh, the um, so to say the uh, uh, um, honor of opening the dances. So Jarek asks whether uh, you tried other spectral densities, um, like for instance the Lorentz Drude. No, um, I, I have not tried yet the Lorentz root. Like I tried this one because you can kind of con kind you can connect it to non markovianity Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I uh, thank you for your answer. I'm sure there will be more questions on on Discord. I have a question myself. Mm -hmm. Actually, have a, a few, but I think we have time for only one of them. Okay. And is the following. So I'm I'm, I'm very interested in non equilibrium in non equilibrium uh, in particular non equilibrium thermodynamics. Yes, yes. Um, open and closed systems. And and um, say this um, autoc approach, so, right? Yeah. So you, what you right? So it's basically just the uh, the Lorentz echo, at least in the closed system case, is the is is very strongly linked to the Lorentz echo of the dynamics that you are implementing. Now, the fact that you are seeing different uh, different behaviors of your f f of t, yeah um, uh, function uh, when you reverse or not the dynamics as in. Does it, uh, so have you explored the implications for the Tasaki Crookes theorem? So basically, no. uh, the breakdown of micro reversibility. Micro -reversi no, 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 I have, I have not tried it. No, but, but it seems interesting. Okay. Yeah. Maybe we can discuss. Yeah, it. because it's, it, it's basically just the connection to what, um, to what time reversal would, 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 would imply. Um, I am looking at this query. It doesn't seem that there, there, there is any other question. Uh, we are one minute ahead of schedule, so maybe I will allow myself the, <laughs> the okay. luxury of asking you the second question that I had, if you don't mind. Yeah, um, sure. can, you, can you go back again to the uh, inequality linking the FT up, up, up? That is, no, 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 that, 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 that's it. So is the inequality that you're establishing telling you that basically the um, number of trajectories that you have in one picture, so in the close, picture versus the open picture, mm -hmm. the open dynamics is, is different. So, so to say, in one case, the open system dynamics, the system is allowed to explore more physical configurations, more trajectories than, than what in the open system would do. And this is how I interpret the result, really, because uh, maybe, OK, trajectories is, is a, a a strange notion here because like these are tra trajectories over like the spin path integrals yeah but if you think about uh, how people explain scrambling so so people who say that like this information becomes non local because it correlates with other degrees of freedom like if you uh, attach environment you have more degrees of freedom to which you can correlate so this is my interpretation of that result so so this information yeah, is very interesting yeah we will have to talk, I think. Okay. Yes, uh, yes, my dogs sure. are barking. This is a this is a very good moment to stop, given that the okay. dogs are barking and they don't want to annoy everyone. So thank you, Jan, for your okay. presentation.